could I just say how good it is to see all old colleagues for real at last. This is the fourth time we've tried to appear in Rome, and at last we've, we've got here. So uh, what have we been up to in the last year or so? Well, one of the things that we've done is a uh, kind of a, a wrapper sort of thing for accessing an Oracle database from Forth. Some of you will remember that um, from previous talks about FQL, the fourth query language, that our normal database that we use is uh, either MySQL or, or one of the forks of that, such, such as MariaDB. And uh, this is for very good reasons. Uh, MySQL does absolutely everything that we need. It's uh, really solid and hardly ever goes wrong. And um, it's um, relatively straightforward to connect to. So you might ask, you know, why anybody would want to use an Oracle database. I, I should say, by the way, that Oracle Corporation uh, not only uh, owns its own Oracle database, but it actually controls MySQL as well these days. Um, as a result of it acquiring Sun Microsystems some years ago. And when this happened, everybody got terribly, terribly worried um, because uh, they thought that Oracle might um, try to uh, uh, stop MySQL from being open source anymore. And so various forks were made. Um, in fact, Oracle has persisted in uh, making MySQL open source. So, so far, um, all, is rel all is relatively well from, from that point of view. But anyway, why use Oracle in that case? And actually, it was a bit funny, really, because when, uh, when we checked in yesterday afternoon, and we were given a room which has a lovely view of the um, car park. So my wife went down to the reception and said, um, could we possibly change this to have a nice view of the garden? And the receptionist, I think, perhaps didn't really entirely understand us. And she said, no, why? <laughs> well, explaining why a view of a garden is better than a view of a car park is relatively straightforward. But explaining why anybody would want to use Oracle instead of MySQL is, is really difficult to explain, as a matter of fact. There's very few things that Oracle itself can do that MySQL cannot do these days. Um, there was a time a few years ago when distributed, large distributed systems were not so easy. You know, replication and things like that in MySQL was not that easy, but these days MySQL supports virtually all modes that you can think of. Oracle does have a few extra indexing methods, but to be honest, they are um, very, um, it's very unlikely that an ordinary user would actually uh, need any of these. <coughs> oh, sorry for the cough, by the way. I have tested for COVID, and yes, I am clear. So if I cough, I will only be giving you a cold and not COVID. So, well, that's not for people online, unless there is some miracle of uh, transmission. <laughs> so, yeah, so there we are with Oracle. Very, very difficult to learn. Um, very expensive to use, um, and you are dependent on Oracle themselves for supporting you, whereas with MySQL, there's, uh, there's enormous numbers of forums out there which will help you to get out of difficulties. Not that there are very many difficulties, to be perfectly honest. However, we do have a number of customers which use uh, the Oracle database for their office systems. And so every now and again, uh, we need to um, download inf information from those office systems. And uh, for example, the, one of our customers gets a new customer of their own, um, needs to enter it just once on their office database. And our system needs to have a little look every now and again to see if there are any new customers. And if there are, they need to download the information that we need for our automation systems uh, from the Oracle database. So we have to connect to Oracle, unfortunately. 
And uh, until quite recently, there were only two methods for accessing an Oracle database from an external system. Uh, there was a thing called the Oracle Call Interface, which was basically an absolutely gigantic library, uh, which was so complicated uh, that it probably took you about a week and an enormous number of functions uh, just to make a connection to the database without actually doing anything. So that was the main, the main method for connecting. And there was also ODBC as a possibility and so um, ODBC, you probably remember, we used to use for MySQL as well in the old days. But OBC, ODBC in the long term um, adds one level of complexity to the maintenance that you have to do. And we, you, we started getting problems with versioning and this kind of thing. So some considerable time ago now, we dropped using ODBC for MySQL. We, we originally had this genius idea that... Um, because SQL was standardized, you know, like fourth is standardized, then it would be possible to actually move um, to a different database if we fancied. But naturally, all versions of SQL are slightly different, perhaps not quite as different as all versions of fourth, but still significantly different. So ODBC is a pain, really, and uh, we would prefer not to use that. Fortunately, more recently, Oracle have come up with this ODPI-C thing, which is basically a C wrapper inside their own, uh, well, outside their own um, API. And this makes it really simple to connect to an Oracle database. That is to say, when I say reasonably simple, it is only about five times as difficult as, as connecting to MySQL. So, but, you know, it's possible, it's possible. So let's just summarize the kind of things that we might, uh, we might need to do with an Oracle database. It would not be used as our own database, this is clear. Uh, we are connecting to somebody else's database here, and uh, they are normally quite neurotic, and so we never actually get to see what their database tables look like. Uh, if we want to get any, any information from them, uh, we use a select not on a database ta a table, but on a view, um, a carefully prepared subset, which uh, on a need to know basis, they allow us to take a little look at. And if we want to send back information to them, the kind of information we, we need to send back to them is, uh, for example, to report that uh, we've just finished washing 100 horribly dirty sheets from the Euroforth conference at this hotel, then uh, we would use uh, not an insert into in, in their log file, we would actually call one of their prepared statements and fill in just the appropriate parameters. And of course, at their end, they would do a careful set of checks on the parameters that we've given them so that we're not giving them any sort of rubbish. So the kind of things that we need to do are relatively straightforward. So what sort of things do we need? And I haven't illustrated these uh, here on the overhead projector, but if you look um, inside the paper here, uh, which is on page 21, first of all, we need uh, a few data types. Um, I have to say that um, we, we, in order to do the two things that I mentioned earlier, we only need quite a small subset. Uh, from their enormous set of header files. So fortunately, it's, it's relatively straightforward. So we need a few data types. I always formally declare data types these days. In, in the old days, when I was doing external um, declarations, I was very sort of free and easy with void star and int anything and this kind of thing. And it was only when, um, when you get to uh, the 32-bit to 64-bit migration that these things come back to bite you. And uh, since then, I've been um, absolutely rigid in always declaring data types. So they're declared in the normal way, uh, as you can see there on page 21 of, our, of uh, the paper. <clears throat> then we need the external function declarations. And it turns out that uh, we probably actually only need 20 or 30 functions uh, to do what we need to do. 
uh, if it had been MySQL, we could probably have done it in about five. Um, we then need to uh, declare a number of complicated constants there, and those can be generally pulled through by just copying and pasting uh, selected hash defines from the uh, Oracle header file and popping them straight in our fourth source code. And then very, very carefully, we need to define a small number of uh, structures. And one of the difficulties, of course, with replicating C structures is uh, their annoying tendency to insert little gaps in the middle for alignment, address alignment. So having declared our fourth structures, which do not automatically insert alignment, um, I normally go through the whole structure um, validating that the offsets for the C code uh, match the offsets for the fourth code. And in VFX fourth, there is a, a really useful little program, which Stephen doesn't actually advertise very much, but you can find it in the back of his code somewhere, which enables you to replicate structures in both types and validate that the offsets are correct. So thank you for that, Stephen. I can't remember, but I, I, I use it all the time. It's a, it's a little noddy C program, and you can, just, you can just put in any arbitrary C structure, and it'll tell you what all the offsets really are, and then you can just compare it with your own. So uh, now this is a relatively simple implementation, so we made some design decisions to keep it simple. And the first thing is that uh, we decided that all the uh, interface with the Oracle is going to happen in only one thread, and therefore none of our code needs to be thread safe. Um, as opposed to fourth query language, which is completely thread safe, necessarily because a lot of the background database stuff um, takes quite a lot of processing power and is done in separate threads. Uh, the second design decision that we made uh, was that we would make a new connection with Oracle for um, each statement, um, each uh, call, and each select that we were going to do. Uh, and the main reason for that was to keep the error control straightforward and simple. And um, because we are actually only talking to the Oracle database, relatively infrequently, um, maybe once every four or five seconds or something like that. The overhead for, cre for creating a new connection is not very high, and so this is a practical way of doing it. And the third thing that we needed to do was, um, of course, because the Oracle database is, is basically an office system, uh, the kind of thing that happens is that the 5 p.m. every day, everybody in the office goes home, and the, the guys who are looking after the Oracle database think they can rub their hands with glee and, and think, oh, now we can shut the database down and do a bit of maintenance on the Oracle database. Meanwhile, down on the shop floor where we're automating all the equipment, we are all still working. And uh, therefore, when we uh, need to do a write to Oracle, we need a queuing system so that we don't miss any data while the Oracle database is down. And we actually achieve that uh, in this particular system by uh, writing to one of our own database tables first and then using our Oracle thread to periodically query our own database table and one by one sending each uh, statement required, each call uh, to uh, the Oracle system. And if that succeeds, then we delete the item from our own database table. So that just comes along in the background there. So now let's move uh, right away to the fundamental um, fourth word here, uh, which is uh, how to do an Oracle query. And this just takes uh, one input parameter, which is a, a pointer, as you can see, to um, a zero terminated string, which is the SQL query. And just going briefly through that, um, the, the, the connection to uh, the Oracle is a, a multi-stage process. You first have to produce a context, um, and then you can see that I do a cleanup from the previous uh, connection before doing uh, a new connect for each uh, statement. 
And assuming the connection is OK, again, the complexity in Oracle is that you need to tell it to prepare the statement first before execution. And then you execute the statement. And then uh, we are dealing with the, uh, the possibility that the Oracle database is going to be down or something like that. And so if everything went OK, uh, then we reset our retry time. And we've done it all is well. And then down the bottom there, um, if anything goes wrong, a really weird thing happens with Oracle. Um, when, you, when, you make, when you create a context, uh, you pass it an address of a place to um, put the handle to the context. If anything goes wrong, for some bizarre reason, Oracle actually corrupts the, cont the contents of that address which means that you cannot then um, formally delete the old context. You have to actually remember, when you get a successful uh, creation of a context, you have to remember what it is in some separate place so that if anything goes wrong, you can actually formally delete the context, the correct context, uh, because you can't delete the corrupted one. So there we have it, basically. That's a, the basic wrapper function, so if you put an appropriate SQL statement into there, you would get something out. Let's have a little look at the uh, connection function uh, there. Oh, first of all, let's, uh, let's look at uh, the error bit there. Uh, so uh, all Oracle API functions uh, return a standard uh, a standard return basically to say whether everything was okay or whether anything went wrong. And so Oracle error there, the fourth word, Oracle error, deals with uh, analyzing what the error actually was. And uh, further on down in Oracle Connect, you can see the fourth word error at the end there. What, what that does, do you remember a few years ago, some of you might remember that I described how we do error logging? And so basically uh, the, the word error there writes this message failed to connect to Oracle and why, and puts that in our error log, so later on we can, we can go and have a look and see what had gone wrong. <coughs> Otherwise, the connect function there is relatively straightforward, as you can see. So now, typical usage, um, select. So here we are um, importing some product information from the Oracle database and sticking it in our database somehow or other. And so you can see that the, um, the, the uh, SQL code is relatively straightforward here. I decided in this case not to emulate fourth query language, uh, which has this nice system where you can switch very easily between fourth and SQL. Here, because the, um, the queries that you're using are relatively straightforward, I've just used um, zero terminated string concatenation in order to generate the query. That obviously gives you a limitation on the length of the query, which is not present in SQL, but is adequate for what we need to do here. If you were going to use Oracle more seriously, it would be possible to emulate fourth query language methods to generate the query. So we run the query, and now we have to uh, fetch the uh, resulting data and analyze it. And I'll come to a little bit more about that in a minute because the way that you have to handle that is completely different in Oracle compared with MySQL. Uh, an insert is, of course, much more straightforward because you've got no data coming back. So now, in uh, MySQL, uh, the data set that you get back from a select statement um, is basically a large matrix consisting of uh, pointers to zero, zero terminated strings. So everything in MySQL comes back to you as a string. If you query a numerical uh, column in your database, it comes back to you as a string and you have to then convert it into a number if you're going to use it in your code. Um, the Oracle system is much more complicated from that. Uh, because it uh, gives you a pointer to a structure 
and the structure is different for each data type. And some of those data types are relatively straightforward and some of those are rather more um, complicated there. Uh, so um, looking at the string function, for example, at the bottom, um, you have to fetch. Uh, you, first of all, you get the address of the structure and then you uh, get the byte count and then you put those together in order to uh, return a, uh, a fourth-like um, string there. Um, looking at the stage one there, actually fetching the row, um, I think I want to say a bit more about that because that has a horrible, horrible 32-bit to 64-bit problem in it. So this code was working all beautifully in 32-bit and then when we converted to 64-bit it didn't work anymore. <coughs> and this is because um, of the um, int discussion, which um, Stephen and I uh, had a little, a little go out a few, uh, a few euro fourths ago on the grounds that um, I, I thought that ints were 32-bit and Stephen thinks that ints are 64-bit. And this is a horrible um, illustration of the fact that ints are actually 32-bit. Um, now, um, this thing here, <laughs> it, this, this function here, isn't it terrible? Poor C function programmers can only return one parameter. So if you want to return two parameters, like you do in this particular DPI statement underscore fetch thing here, you have to ask the fourth programmer to give you an address in which to put the result. And this result, all it is, is a Boolean. And when you go through the whole process of trying to figure out what C means by a Boolean, the answer is a Boolean in C is 32 bits in 64-bit Linux. And so I only want this Boolean for about, you know, one nanosecond or something like that. So I think, oh, right, I'll stick this in a local value p found. But of course, p found creates a 64-bit value which is not initialized. And therefore, when our Oracle uh, API call writes to p found, it's only writing to half of it. So if you forget to do to zero your p found in the first place, and I have to say this particular problem, we had it when we were converting to 64-bit, we had it probably in at least a dozen places in our code, and they were fearfully difficult to find. So I'd actually like to put my hand up and say, it wouldn't be wonderful if the ANSI people insisted that local values were always automatically initialized. Wouldn't that be? Oh, no, I, I'm sorry for asking. Sorry for, I, I'm sorry for asking. I did ask Anton what the procedure might be for asking for that, and it was so complicated. I decided I probably wouldn't be alive by the time it, it happened. But so you do have to be very, very careful when you get uh, information coming back and you're putting it into a value or uh, a local value. That's it, chaps. Hope you enjoyed it. D uh, did you mean, could I overwrite the way VFX handles local values and make it so that they did initialize by themselves. And the answer is I do know enough about VFX now to say, yes, I could do that, but it would be a bit cheeky, you know. <laughs> <laughs>